Our work in Weipa was done and it was time to head to the Torres Straits. We were waiting for just the right tide and some wind to pick up. We just went for a little bit of a look, just hiding behind Doifkin Point and see if we can pick up a little bit of a fish for the cruise. Okay, so we've pulled up to anchor here. Um, so we're going to do just a bit of lazy fishing. So I went and cast netted some bait. These are snub nose gar. I think they're called ballyhoo in the States. So really great. But and that doesn't look like a garfish on top. Oh, the old squid. And it got done by the spear, didn't it? Yep. So we've got our we've got our gar. Yep. And I spread the eye of this hook and made us made us a gang. Push it through. The whole fish. Eh. Like that. And then that one lines up nicely through the eye. So there we lined up the back one first. Yep. Then that enabled that one to go straight through the eye there. A running sinker going straight to it, okay, and that's just going to go overboard. Throw her in. Mm. Whoa, doll! Golden trevally, yep. a beauty. Look how thick its tail is. His head's caved in, is that how they go? No, it's just how they are. Because his lips have pulled out. Uh -huh. <sighs> that is a good sized fish, lots of food. <laughs> we are done with fishing for a little while. Yeah. So, some people aren't that keen on trevally, but these golden trevally, they're really good. So, mm. this is Namas and a little bit of Kentucky Fried, I think. Mmm, yeah, Kentucky. Wow. Mm. Pick it up, Marie. It's good. So that's the embryonic uh, coconut tree. So this stuff in the Pacific Islands. If you're an invalid or if you're a little baby, you're going to get this because this is just full of goodness and it's delicious. So there's a, on the on the outside here, there's a lot of that coconut oil. Like my hands are super greasy. Look. Wow. Oil up my parang. <laughs> but um, yeah, this is delicious. So it's easily assimilated into your body, full of nutrition. Really, really great food. Mm. These coconuts are quite hard to get into at this stage, very fibrous. Um, I don't know if I'm the best person in the world at getting into these. And I suppose if you talk to a Pacific Islander or someone out of Thailand or Vietnam, they'd put me to shame, but I did get into it. Mm. 
harvesting coconut oil, no. coconut butter. As we'd hoped, a little bit of wind just started puffing up, so we decided to head off. No time like the present. And one of the local birds decided he wanted to test out our wind indicator, which is always a bit of a hazard. Right, fish on. So let's have a look at the steps that I use to land a fish single-handedly, and I haven't got Pascal at my side helping out. All right, step one is to just depower the yacht, and here I'm just furling the head sail. That's gonna solve two problems. Um, one, it's gonna slow us down, so it's gonna be a bit easier to fight the fish. Um, and I won't be leaping off those waves, so I won't be getting thrown around while I'm in the middle of the fight. And then it's just grab the rod, fight the fish until it's fairly exhausted, and try and get alongside. Now with a fish about to come into the cockpit, I really need to clear all the ropes. So the rod goes back in the holder, everything gets tidied up and make sure that there's nothing there for that tuna to spill blood on. Okay, we bring the fish alongside, get the gaff into it, and the most important thing, have a club and make sure you really stun that fish. Because you don't want to bring a thrashing fish into a small cockpit with you, particularly when it's got treble hooks stuck to it. You don't want to become attached to a couple of kilos of angry tuna. And now all that remains is to turn that into delicious sushi. Well, we've got a bit of lightning coming and in the past I used to have some nice big heavy duty jumper leads that I could just connect to my shrouds and put in the water. Um, I haven't got that at the moment so we've done a little bit of a dodgy thing and that's just the lifelines themselves just contact them with the shrouds and then they lead back and they go to the push pit here which is connected to the wind vane which is a nice big metal spade with a big surface area sitting in the water. Um, I, I don't know if it's a really great thing. You, you want at least, you know, like 10 mil cross section as a as a 
conductor into the water. Um, but maybe all four will go some way towards saving some of the electrics. So it's a bit of a bit of a wet watch at the moment. Pretty thick, about quarter mile visibility. Um, we're just leaving mainland Australia. We're heading over to the Torres Straits right now. I just opted to sail under head, so we've got the rain canopy up trying to catch a bit of fresh water as we go. Let's have a look at how that's going. So, at the very least, that'll be successful. Looks like the wind's dying on us, the canopy's overloaded. We're going to have to start the uh, start the main engine again. On. This is it's just been never ending. Wind comes, wind goes, wind comes, wind goes. There's nothing consistent. Every front brings the wind and then it goes back into calm straight afterwards. Wet season. Dodger right now. I can just sit here in the hatch, have a bit of a look around, stay dry. So under the Dodger here it's nice and dry, out there is the bathroom at the moment. <laughs> well good morning. We've just had our first experience of the very fickle tides around the Torres Straits. Through the night we'd come up, got drenched, um, and we pulled up at an anchorage waiting for the right tide to go through here, Zuma Passage. Um, we're on our way to Thursday Island. But when we set the alarm to wake up, it was going completely the other way. And, uh, we buggered it, so we went back to bed, and then we heard the anchor chain rumbling, um, and it shifted again, even though it wasn't really supposed to according to the tide because today's tide is not two tides, two highs, two lows, it's just one big slope. So I thought we'd missed out but the tide's starting to go through Zuma Channel so we've ridden that um, and then you want to catch the flood tide up and into TI so that's what we're going to do. It's all, it's all still playing with the tides just like a Kim. It's all northern Australia. Well, they've got such sharp teeth that they can just hit something hard, uh -huh. drop it in the and come back and eat it. Yeah. Well, the tide has still been fairly contrary. Um, it's now well and truly a flooding tide, and the current's coming out of the channel. Um, we were led to believe by the information that we had that on a flood tide, it would be flooding north towards TI. So we've thrown the anchor in, we've made our cup of tea, <laughs> so, we're doing everything that you have to do when it gets to that stage. How's the flies, Pascal? The flies are awful. When we were at Jackson River uh, two nights ago, two nights ago, two days ago, we picked up a whole lot of hitchhikers and we've been killing them relentlessly for the last two days, but they're just hanging around. It literally won't buzz off. So. Buzz off, do you get it? Yeah, so. There's something that you might not uh, have experienced before. When you're sailing around on a boat and there's nothing else around, if you get flies in there, they just do they not leave. leave. And we don't, we haven't carried any poisons. I haven't got any fly traps. We don't have any fly paper. So dealing with them's really, really unusual. Like Pasky said, we just sailed into the Jackson River and the flies just went whoop. Mm. Um, we tried to get rid of as many as we could, but we sailed out of there with about 50. So. No, I reckon more. Must be a hundred. Lots. 
it was a lot. Anyway, I'm going to have the tea, I'm going to go back to bed, and then when the tide turns, in six hours, we're out of here. On our way to dinner, mm. it looks like we might have caught dinner. What a nice, uh, what a oh. That's a pretty good recommendation for a harbour. We were just shifting locations to go and have dinner, and we caught dinner. So that's our welcome to Thursday Island. It's only a little mackerel, just the right size, nothing too big. We're not out to set records, it's just to feed the scale and all. So this is a very good size mackerel.